looking at accessibility and inclusive design, how they are not exactly the same, but they are both very important parts of any product. Um, and how we as designers can combine both principles to create a product that can be accessible, usable, and enjoyable by everyone, regardless of their individual capabilities or disabilities. Um, and hopefully there's some time at the end for Q&A. All right, so before we start, a little bit about me. Um, as you all know, my name is Tana. I'm a product designer currently at Disney. Um, I was born and grew up in Thailand. Um, and came to America when I was 18. Um, some of the things I really like to do, I love watching movies, um, especially movies with beautiful cinematography. Um, many people like reading books to be inspired, but for me, I like seeing the visuals, hearing the sounds, learning the stories. Um, sometimes that helps spark my creativity. Um, of course, depending on the kind of movie too. Um, I love Wes Anderson films, A24, and the latest movie that I got a chance to watch was uh, Nomadland, which is very, really amazing. Um, lots of beautiful compositions and color. I also love traveling. Um, the last two images are from our Iceland trip, pre-COVID, of course. Um, we went on a leisure hike and going to ice caves. It was awesome. And you know, I, I wanted to mention my background because I feel like being an immigrant and the fact that I love to travel to different places, I love to learn about different culture and talking to people. I think that has shaped um, who I am as a designer today and that's why I care so much about designing products for all people. So enough about me, why should you care? Um, believe it or not, you are not your user. Um, it's very, a very simple statement, but it's something that is very true and I, I still have to remind myself every day. Um, when designing, it can be easy to assume that people who will use your product are just like you or your friends or your colleague. Um, and it's completely normal to think like that though, because this is a common human behavior called the false consensus effect, um, which is basically referred to when you assume other people will agree with you, think like you or behave like you when they may not. So unless you are designing a product for only yourself to use, you have to look beyond just you and your social circle and have empathy for your users. Um, according to the World Health Organization, more than a billion people in the world live with some form of disability. And that's 15% of the world's population. Um, they are the world's largest minority. In the uh, United States alone, 61 million adults have some type of disability, and that's one in four adults, according to the CDC. So as more and more people depend on digital product for everything we do, we as a designer have the power to ensure that the product we design can be used and enjoyed by everyone. So when you hear the word accessibility, what comes into your mind? Um, I will shamefully admit that when I was just getting into design, I never really paid attention to accessibility and what it actually meant. I only thought about people with some form of disability that I can see, but what I never realized was that people with disabilities are just as diverse as people without disabilities. There are people with visual impairment and that includes people with blindness, low level vision and color blindness. People with hearing impairments who have either low hearing level or no hearing at all. People with mobility impairments, which can range from purely physical like polarities to people who might have difficult making heart, uh, hand movements. And people with cognitive impairments. Um, this also includes a broad range of disabilities from people with intellectual ability to people with learning disabilities. Who may, uh, like the lecture, who may have difficulty with understanding content or easily confused by inconsistent web page layout. So the good news is we as a society have come so far in making things accessible for people with disabilities. We have ADA compliance, um, accessibility, accessibility standards, guidelines, and resources. But the problem is many people are treating this like a checklist like, like a test you have to pass, you know, uh, rather than focusing on the experience alone. So while these guidelines ensure a design will be accessible, they don't ensure people will want to use it. So just because a design is accessible, it doesn't mean that it's easy to use, enjoyable or desirable. So is accessibility alone uh, enough? The answer is no. 
Um, accessibility is a great start, but we still have further to go to make a product or service available, uh, accessible while providing the same user experience that people without disability get to enjoy. Um, this is a great example of why accessibility alone is not enough. Um, both, uh, both of the images um, have access, uh, accessible ramp, and you, if you're on a wheelchair, you can probably get through both ramps. But imagine how hard would it be to have to use the ramp in the top image. Uh, the top image. Um, the top image shows how poor planning and a lack of consideration from the beginning has resulted in a negative impact for all users, not just the people who use wheelchair. Um, it's almost like whoever built it just needs to check that accessibility box off the list, right? Um, um, the bottom image on the other hand though, is a result of inclusive design thinking from the beginning. The design is beautiful and functional and the ramp can be used easily by not just people who use uh, view shares, but also cyclists, um, parents pushing strollers, or even um, elderly with knee pain who can't take stairs. Um, so this is Timothy Berners-Lee. He invented the World Wide Web in 1989. He once said, the power of web is in its universality. Access by everyone, regardless of disability, is an essential aspect. So fundamentally, the web is designed for all people, whatever their hardware or software they use, what language they understand, where they are in the world, um, the web should be accessible for all people without distinction. So when we look back to the digital product we design, you can create truly inclusive digital experiences by embedding the core principle of accessibility into everything that you do. Um, and that's when inclusive design thinking comes in. So we often hear people talk about designing with accessibility in mind. Um, we also hear people talk about diversity and inclusion in design. Um, accessibility and inclusivity are both very crucial part of any product. Again, they are not exactly the same, but they, they overlap um, significantly. And together they help make product um, that is truly accessible for all. So before we go into how to combine the true principle together, we need to be able to identify the differences. Um, so here you see accessibility primary focus on people with disability. That includes individual with vision, hearing, speech, mobility, and learning disabilities. Accessibility in design allow user of the worst ability to navigate, understand, and use the UI. It is an attribute of the final product. Inclusive design, on the other hand, is a method that draw on the full range of human diversity. So inclusion is all about diversity and ensuring involvement of everyone to the greatest extent, po extent possible. It involves a broad range of issues, including um, accessibility, language, age, um, education, culture, um, computer skills, and connectivity. Um, so if you look at this chart, you could see that accessibility is a part of inclusive design. But inclusive design incorporates much more than accessibility into the process of design. So designing inclusively doesn't mean that you're making one thing for all people. You are designing a diversity of way for everyone to participate in an experience with a sense of belonging. Um, this is probably one of the best example of accessibility um, and inclusive design that I've seen so far. So on the top image, um, you have an accessible solution to enter the shop where someone in a wheelchair or parents with stroller can use the ramp which lead to the site entrance, which may work, um, but think about the difference in the experience one will have entering the store from the front and on the side, right? Um, for example, if you think of a candle store during Christmas time, um, imagine they always put holiday candles in the front, right? So as you're walking in, you can smell it even before you see it. Um, now imagine if you have to enter the store from the side toward the back, like the photo on the bottom, you probably won't have the same experience as people who are entering through the front. Um, so if we apply inclusive design thinking um, to this uh, from the beginning, we would have had the stairs and the ramp access to the storefront like the photo in the bottom. 
Um, so this, this is the idea that take into account the widest possible audience from the beginning rather than designing something, then think about fixing it later, like um, the image at the top. Um, all right, so by now we know that inclusivity is the key to great design. Um, so let's look at some principle of inclusive design. Um, many of you probably have seen this already, but it's, if not, uh, make sure to check it out. Uh, Microsoft created this amazing inclusive design toolkit, which has been used by a lot of companies um, around the world. So the first principle, recognize exclusion. Um, exclusion happened when we solve problem using our own bias. We as a designer need to proactively look out for points of exclusion and use them to generate new ideas and inclusive designs. Remember that exclusion can be temporary and also situational. So for example, you may be wearing a cast for a period of time, uh, or you may be trying to use your phone while you drive. So understand how and why people are excluded can help highlight opportunity and drive us toward inclusive solutions. Um, next, you know, learn from diversity, right? Um, spend time to observe and understand people who may be different from us. Learn how people adapt to different situations in the world around them can bring fresh and diverse perspective and innovation, uh, innovative solution to your work. Um, remember that inclusive design put people at the center of the very, uh, from the very start of the process. Um, the most important thing to note here is that disability affects all of us. Um, designing for people with disabilities actually result in design that benefit everyone. Um, by designing for someone with a permanent disability, for example, someone with a situational limitation can also benefit. Um, the image on the right here is the persona spectrum created by the Microsoft design team to understand related mismatches and motivation across a spectrum of permanent, temporary, and situational scenarios. Uh, for example, a device designed for a person who has one arm could be used just as effectively by a person with a temporary um, injure, uh, arm injury or a parent holding a baby or a design with high contrast legibility will benefit people who have low vision or vision impairment, as well as a driver looking at a map on their phone while driving. So now let's look at some um, of the accessibility best practices. So there are a ton of uh, best practices out there, um, but I can't possibly cover them all here, um, but uh, here are some of the main ones. Um, the first uh, important, most important one is color contrast. Um, this is one of the first thing that I usually check. Um, so per the web content accessibility guidelines, there are three different levels, um, A, double A, and triple A. Um, in my experience so far, double uh, A is what we try to shoot for most of the time. And that's at least 4.5 by one ratio between the foreground and the background. Um, but if you have a larger text and heavier fonts, um, the ratio become a bit more forgiving. So it could be as low as like three by one. Um, there are many tools that you can use to check this. Um, my, my personal favorite is WebM. Um, you can enter the hex value of your foreground and background color, and it will calculate the contrast ratio and it will say if you pass um, AA or AAA or not. Um, and I was just gonna, Click here so you guys can all see it. Can you guys see my screen? Yep, we can see your screen. Cool. All right, yeah. So this is a really nice um, tool that you can use. So you can test anything here, right? And then they will tell you that what your contrast ratio is, and then if it passed or if it failed. Um, Another great one is this one, which is, uh, I don't use it a lot, but it looks really cool. Like you can, you can input any color and um, you can also like adjust the color uh, hue and saturation and brightness and, and it will show you here if it passed or fail. And the last one here is for image. 
um, uh, if you have text on image, we well, usually you shouldn't have text on image, but if you do, it, it has also it also has a pass accessibility uh, contrast ratio. So here you can upload your image and then like you can see if it you know passed the standard or not. Um, so he's a very great tool. All right. Speaking of color, um, don't just rely on color alone, right? Um, more than 5% of male population has some form of color blindness. And again, it's not just for people with color blindness, but there could be a situation where you're looking at your phone under the sun and the contrast ratio is very, uh, very low. So you can't see the color clearly. So, you know, the example here, you can see that on the top image, it only relies on color um, as the only visual cue. And if you can't tell red and green apart, you have no way to know that you need to update the email field, right? Um, while the image at the bottom use the icon and copy as additional cues. So even though if you can't tell red and green apart, you, you see the X icon, and then you also see the inline error there. Um, next, level forms clearly. So people who use green reader may miss these levels as they, you know, they tap, they use tap to kind of navigate through the page. Um, and if you don't label, if you don't um, use a label, it usually skip over a non-label test, such as placeholder test. Um, also, people with cognitive disabilities may lose track of the form fields intent. Um, even for me, sometimes I forgot what I'm writing, right? So uh, at the top there is kind of like a bash pack twist. If you just have first name as a placeholder and when you tab on it, it's gone. Um, and then on the top right is a good alternative. Um, you know, with that said, you, you could also use floating labels where labels are placed within the form field as placeholder until the, uh, the field become active, like when you tap on the field. So um, that is another alternative way too. Um, and also provide feedback for error. You know, pe people make mistakes, right? So, so do your users. Um, I'm sure some of you may have experienced this at some point where you're filling a form and it's telling you you can't proceed because there's an error, but it doesn't tell you where or why or how. Um, so, and you're stuck there not knowing how to move on. Um, and that's frustrating, right? Um, Recently, my mom was trying to get an appointment for a vaccine and she got stuck on the last page because you know, it said there's an error, but it doesn't tell her where and how to resolve it. So, um, so yeah, so some of the best practices as you see uh, on the image on the right here, you know, provide inline validation. And if you can provide it in real time, that's even better because the user can see where they've made mistake right away while they are still on the field. Um, the last one that I'm going to talk about here is alt text. Um, it's very important and it's probably one of the most neglected ones. Um, people with low vision use screen readers um, to hear what other people see. And also they needed to correctly understand the sense of the image, right? So, um, and this also helps when the image file is not loaded too let's say you have like slow connectivity or you know the page is just not loading um, or if the user has chosen not to view the image um, they can read the alt text uh, as an alternative too and it's also great for seo um, so and if you don't write any alt text some screen reader will read the file name you know after the image that you have so it'll read like one two three four five dot jpeg which is the worst experience you can provide to the user um, so here is an example of an alt text within uh, the alt attribute of the image element from Disneyland website. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see that on the right in the light blue highlighted, but it say a man and woman enjoy their lollipops while laughing. Um, so again, if you using a screen reader, you know, you can, you can get a sense of, of what everyone else is seeing. All right, so now let's look at some of the best practices of when inclusive design take accessibility a step further. Um, first one is uh, always use inclusive image image. 
Um, be mindful about representing users inclusively through your icon, illustration, and photographs. Um, we often imagine a target user who is represented in our design choice um, to be somebody from the majority population, right, due to our familiar assumptions. Um, but if a user can't see someone they related to using the app, they're not gonna, they're gonna have a hard time imagining themselves using it. So the next time you create an onboarding screen, a marketing material, or any other screens that represent your user, uh, make sure to include um, diverse representation from race, clothing, physical ability, and social class. Um, this illustration is a, a amazing example from Airbnb. This is from the their illustration guideline that they created um, a couple of years ago, I believe. Um, you can see that image represent uh, an, an older Asian man um, as a host. You see uh, the child and you see her mom who has a prosthetic leg. Um, so this is like a great example of diversity showing in just one uh, photo. And also on the right, um, you can see all the different type of people in this one image uh, of, this is from Facebook moment. Like uh, when you go to the app store, you see what uh, the app is all about and you see like example of the, uh, the app screen. So, you know, seeing that, right? Like I, I, I can see myself in there, you know, I can see my friends in there and it made me want to use it too. Cause you know, I, I can see that they think about me and everyone else, um, you know, so again, representation matters. Um, so form, form is something that we, we are all used to, right? Um, companies collect a lot of sensitive, uh, sensitive data like name, gender, age, ethnicity. Um, gender, for example, we are so used to just have male and female and as, one, as, as the only options, but that is leaving out a lot of people because some people aren't identified as either of those. So we, you know, as a designer have the power to change that, right? When you, when you are starting to design, um, you can start by asking the question, is it necessary? If, if there isn't a clear benefit to the user, you know, you should, you probably shouldn't ask about it. Um, for example, think about a form with a field inquiring about user sex. Um, why do we want to ask users about a sex, right? Also, uh, as a reminder, the sex and gender are not the same. So is it really sex that you need to know or is it the gender or is it something else? Do you need to know what they identify with or you just want to know what's on the passport? So, you know, always provide, always think about is it necessary and, and is there a, a good reason why? Um, and here's an example of a form that explain the purpose of the sex field um, on the image on the right here. It also, it explained the purpose and also offer more gender information. And on that uh, blue link there, you can click add gender information and, and, and explain it there. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, the form also provide a field in case you wish to use a different name um, from the one in your identification. Um, lastly, use inclusive copy. So content on your site, you know, especially important information should be easily accessible for everyone. Um, think about people with cognitive disabilities or people who are not fluent in the language of your interface. Um, complicated use terms and endless paragraphs make things unnecessarily difficult for them, right? Um, so a good example here uh, on the right, um, Instead of saying buffering, you know, just saying preparing video, because some people might not know what buffering means. It's like a technical jargon, right? Um, or uh, instead of saying, would you like to save your changes, which is very wordy, you can just say, keep it short, short and say, save changes. Um, or you must register before you can vote. Again, that's very long. Um, so you can just say, register to vote and enable location history, you know, maybe use a little more simple word uh, than enable, like turn on location history. Um, so yeah, if you just kind of look at keeping it simple, both on like all the um, 
elements on your screen on in your app and also like copy as well keeping it as simple as possible so everyone can um, enjoy and use your product so um i i want to talk a little bit about the misconceptions that people tend to have when talking about accessibility and inclusive design um myth number one Accessible and inclusive design only benefits small percentage of people with disability. Um, and we, we all know that it's not true because, you know, we've just covered uh, during, during this whole presentation, right? We, we talk, uh, when we talk about disabilities, it's not just what you can visually see, like people in wheelchairs or people who are blind. You know, the key here is that disability are not always permanent too. They can be temporary and, and situational. Um, again, as for example, if, an, if I'm in a library and I want to watch YouTube on my phone, but I forgot my headphone, right? I can benefit from reading those, uh, the closed caption in the video that was initially created for people with hard of hearing. Um, or another example, if I'm outside using my phone in a bright sunlight, I can benefit from high contrast screen um, setting that were initially made to benefit people with vision impairment. So accessible and inclusive design make great design for everyone. Myth number two, um, accessible and inclusive design is expensive and takes too much extra time. Um, so, you know, during your design process, you already consider user experience, use cases and workflows and emotions and all that, you know, you can simply bake inclusive design thinking right in by widen the type of use case and interaction a user may have, right? So when you include this from the start, you actually avoid backtracking and any related increases in timeline, effort and budget not to mention lawsuits and, and also poor rep reputation. And last one, this is my favorite. Um, accessible and inclusive design is uncreative, ugly, and boring. So, you know, what, what do you think when you hear accessibility, inclusive design? Uh, I actually used to think about, I used to picture like a government website, you know, or any website that doesn't look appearing. And, and sometimes that's true because many websites optimized for accessibility do consist of plain text and white background with simple images, you know, with a little consideration of visual appeal, but they don't always have to look like that. Um, as a designer, you can pay attention to things like layout, color, and visual hierarchy. Um, you can still have a visually appealing, simple to use and accessible product. And also design isn't just about all about looking pretty anyway, right? It's about finding problem and solving them creatively. So, you know, we design product that makes people's lives better, not for them to only admire, uh, to admire the beauty of it. So I have some example that I, I really like, and it's a very great example of a website that looks great and also accessible. Um, and I'm just gonna open it in the browser so we can all look at it together. So here is, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but it's the White House website. Um, again, earlier I said that when I think of accessibility or like unattractive website, I think of government website. And it's just like uh, totally different, right? Um, they, you know, with the use of like uh, typography and in color, um, uh, hierarchy, you know, and even like this, this little design element, like the line here, the line here, and having this rounded corner images and carry it throughout the whole website, it looks really great, right? Um, it, it doesn't look clutter, it doesn't look ugly at all to me. Um, and another thing that they have here is they have a toggle that you can turn on um, the high contrast. Uh, mode, so you can see it in um, a different setting, which is awesome. And then also they have this large font size toggle. So if you if you want to see that if you can't read the text and you need it to be larger, you know you can toggle that. And and look here when you toggle it, right? It's responsive too. Um, it's not just like 
making everything big and off the screen, it actually responds to you. So you see that the menu button is bigger, the layout here is different, um, even like the graphs here is bigger. Um, so yeah, so I think this is a really good example. Another great example, uh, again, kind of like a, a government kind of website, uh, CIA.gov. <laughs> Who knows CIA would have a good website. So um, I'm just gonna go ahead and click on it again. So another example of accessible website that looks awesome, right? Um, it looks like, I don't know about you, but it doesn't look like a CIA website to me. <laughs> it's just like, um, like a, I don't know, something else, you know? Um, you have like great typography, um, even the image here, I don't know if you can tell, but there's like a texture on top of it that kind of match with the um, graphic element in the background there, make everything look so consistent. And they have this line that come down across so it kind of lead your eyes throughout the page. Um, and like even this kind of thing is really awesome. I also want to show you this page that I was looking at. Like this is just like it come out of an editorial website or something. Even the, uh, the use of images too, like they all look very consistent. And again, I think using the texture on top of it, make it like very consistent. So, you know, maybe we want to work at CIA. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, so, so that was a, a great example of beautiful website that's still accessible. Um, so I want to end this workshop with this video from Apple from a few years ago. Um, some of you may have seen it, um, but um, it's a really great example, uh, a video that's showcasing people using life-changing uh, assist assistive technology. So I'm going to go ahead and play the video. And, and if you don't hear the sound, if someone could let me know, that'd be great. But if you hear it, we'll just watch it like a minute long. People think that having a disability is a barrier. But that's not the way I see it. <laughs> You can catch up with friends. Ready? You can capture a moment with your family. One face, small face, focus lock. And you can start the day bright and early. You can take a trip to somewhere new. You can concentrate on every word of a story. A bird began to sing. Jack opened his eyes. You can take the long way home. <laughs> or edit a film like this one. When technology is designed for everyone, it lets anyone do what they love, including me. Oops. So yeah, uh, I was watching this video, uh, I think yesterday and I was like smiling and tearing up and I don't know I just felt as so happy you know just watching you know technology and and and, and product you know available for everyone right so you know we've talked about all these guidelines and best practices for the web and app right? but you know looking beyond that to be truly accessible and inclusive at the core level you need to create service and product that meet the need of people um, with any type of uh, 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 special um, requirement and all that, right? 
So you probably saw quite a few product um, feature that benefit people in the video. Um, now imagine if those accessibility features didn't exist, right? Um, in the video, you saw a guy who was blind taking a photo of his family. He uses voiceover to navigate and ensure that he's capturing steady images and what he wants to capture uh, in frame. Um, and also, you know, Sadie, who, who's the video editor there, um, she was born with uh, cerebral palsy, a condition that caused a lack of control in movement and muscle coordination. She was able to edit an entire video um, by using switch control uh, feature that connects to her wheelchair. Um, you know, I, I can't even edit an entire video like that. So that's really awesome. Um, so I, I want you all to leave this workshop and feel empowered to start including accessible and inclusive design thinking into everything that you do, because there's just so many people out there that are not like us and don't look like us. Um, and again, we as designers have power to lower the barriers and create products that are accessible, uh, usable, and enjoyable by everyone. Um, that is it. Thank you. And I guess that's Q and A time. Um, if anyone have any questions for me, yeah, for sure. Thank you so much, uh, Tana. That was a really, really enlightening. Um, presentation. I loved it. I think we all really did. There's a lot of thank yous in the chat. Um, and yeah, if anybody has any questions um, that they'd like to ask, you can unmute yourself, speak up or pop them in the chat. Actually, I don't know if we have the unmute capability, but pop your question in the chat. Um, and we'll go ahead and ask. Yeah. But yeah, I was totally shocked by the CIA website. It was unreal. Yeah. I was not expecting that. It, I thought it was like a modeling uh, uh, recruitment website. <laughs> it's like, whoa, look at all these cool looking people. Like, I want to work there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely made me think I wanted to join the CIA for a second. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, that's amazing. We have a question from Haley. Um, she's, um, you're very young, but you have a mission behind your work. How do you find your mission and how does it empower you? Hmm, that's a really empower, empowering question. <laughs> um, I, I guess, again, I feel like because of my background and how, you know, I am an immigrant. I was born in Thailand. I grew up there. I came here when I was young and I like to travel, I like to get to know people and learn different culture. I think that kind of thing, that 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 human interaction, that in, the interest and the curiosity that I have and open minus that I have just to anything, right? I, I like to learn and I, I just always like to find new things, talk to new people. I think that made me kind of who, how I am and like, and that kind of reflects on the way I, I design things like I used to only design like the thing that I think look cool and like you know just cool looking and pretty but I think the more I, I started working especially in product um, especially working at Disney you know we always think about our guests um, you know it's not about you again it's about uh, your guest your user so yeah yeah that's really that's really great um, and I think that's it's very inspiring for a lot of us here who are just kind of also young and getting into it, uh, getting into yeah. design, for sure. Yeah. Um, Thank you for the question. I'll, as we kind of wait for any questions that anybody might be thinking of, they might be pondering on it, um, I can go ahead and ask one. Um, do you have any sort of very memorable or um, standout project or products that you've worked on yourself um, especially as it applies to inclusivity and accessibility. Mm. Let me think. I think so. I, I worked on a project to redesign um, a checkout flow on our uh, Disneyland and Disney World um, uh, website. And you know, going in, I did not think much about it because I, you know, I thought checkout is just a 
very, very straightforward page, right? You just, you have your name field and you have your uh, credit card field and then you have a button and then it's done. But, you know, it is much more than that, like going into it. Um, there's so many age cases and so many people we have to think about. We have to think about people um, who have kids, you know, people who, um, in, in some case, we have, uh, in some case, when guests want to book like a hotel, we need to, or like a cruise or a flight, we have to think about, um, you know, the passport information. And, and like I mentioned, like, oh, we need to ask the gender and like, oh, but, you know, we don't want to be not inclusive, but do we, we have to ask it for their passport information. So we have to think about how we're going to ask them and have to explain why. So, yeah, I think just from that straightforward uh, uh, project, it turned into something that much bigger than that. And it's just very eye opening for me. Yeah, that's so cool. Like a simple function that you might not actually think a lot about can have a lot of different aspects and impact. Yeah. Yeah, like before getting into product design, you know, it's like everything, the thing that you use every day, right? your phone, your email, I'm sure every product are very complicated. Uh, some I heard someone said, you, you as a designer, you spent 20%, you spent 80% of the time designing something that people will use for the 20%. And then 80% of your time you spend on eight cases and error state and all that for like 20% of the time that people are gonna see it. So that, that's very interesting to me when I hear that and that's very true. Yeah, um, we got a couple more questions actually. So um, I have one from Fiona who says, have you experienced working with teams that ignore the inclusivity aspect of their product? And if so, how have you gone about addressing that? Um, I can't say that I have actually, because I think Disney is a very uh, a great design team. And we always, again, have our guests in mind because our guests are so diverse. Like we, the product that we design are not just for the people here, but you know, we have tourists, we have uh, people coming in from different country, different part of the world. So we always have to think about different type of people. Um, so um, I, I don't know if I have ever experienced that, but if, if that ever happened, you know, we, I think a good start is to show a sample um, to, to whoever kind of not wanting to include inclusivity design kind of that thinking. Um, that, and there's a lot of sample out there that you can show and, uh, and, and maybe you can learn and start from there. Yeah, great answer. Thank you, thank you. Um, and then we have one from, another one from Haley, um, which says, how do you know when your project is completely and universally accessible and inclusive? And are you ever done with a quest like this? You know, <laughs> After talking to you all about how inclusive and accessible your product have to be, right? In reality, like there's no, uh, no like a hundred percent check that you know, you you can check everything off your your list. But I think we we always gonna try to be as you know inclusive and and accessible to majority of people we can. Um, and maybe I think you can also look at your user too. Um, and trying to, instead of thinking about all our different type of people, just maybe focus on your user first and the data that you have, and that, that can help, I think. Yeah, for sure, for sure. User research, definitely. And that's something that um, anyone here who's competing, definitely looking into user research is very helpful. Um, oh, cool. We have time for, oh yeah, we do have a little bit of time for a couple questions. Um, we have one from Christine who asks, when you changed your career from advertising to UI UX, did you have to start from an internship? And what was the career transition experience like for you? Um, so yeah, so, so I was working in advertising, right? And you know, after a while I started to like, look around and question myself and like, what am I doing here? I'm not enjoying my work. Um, and I, I discovered US design, I forgot from there. And cause I didn't learn in college. So you guys are so cool that you, you're learning about it now. Um, but 
I so then I I took some classes um, at at UCLA Extension, and you know I started to work on my portfolio um, with the project that I did in class, and also I had some passion project that I work on too, and I start to build my portfolio, you know, from then. So I was still working full time, and also after work I would like work on my portfolio and started applying, and you know. The, it took like almost a year actually for me to to land this job and it, it was very painful <laughs> so I, I understand everyone who's looking for a job right now or, or applying um but you know I, I i it was yeah it was uh i guess worth it right um i i worked hard and you know kind of paid off um and i did not have to start from internship i think because i have background in design and, and, you know, the company kind of see that I can use that to uh, utilize my skills. And I, I was maybe stronger in like a visual and UI aspect of it. I wasn't like strong in UX. So, you know, that kind of balanced it off. Um, so, but I did have to start as like a entry level product designer, even though I have, even though I had like three years of experience as a designer. That's very cool. Thank you for sharing that like whole journey with us. Um, yeah, it's, it's really great to kind of hear, I don't know, hurdles and things that we go through. Um, and definitely yeah. um, building portfolio is something I guess we hear a lot about. Um, and I'd highly recommend anybody who has a project coming out of Catalyst to add it to your portfolio. I feel like yeah. it can be very helpful. <laughs> At the project from this kind of event is really great because you guys have like what two or three days only to to get put it together and it it shows how passionate you are it shows how you can work fast and it shows how you very flexible and hardworking. it just shows so much from this this type of uh, event and project so definitely highly recommend add it on to your portfolio definitely definitely um and it looks like we have one more question um, from Da, who says, Hi, Tana, love your background, by the way. Can you talk about the most challenging time when you're building websites or apps and how you cope with it? Um, the most challenging time, I think the most challenging time is when, when the project is started and when you get bombarded with a list of business requirement and, you know, you want to do all of this and then you go to uh, the engineer team and they say, we can't do all of that. <laughs> and then you as a designer is kind of like a middle person. And you also, as a designer, you want your product, your design to look good, right? So you have to kind of push and pull and, and fight the fight and kind of like see what you can do at the most to accommodate everyone while maintaining and, and building this this product that you also want to you know be proud of and also uh, obviously be good for your user so i think you know yeah like kind of sacrificing something to gain something to to kind of please everyone because when you design in real world right it's not just you and designer there's business need and there's like other stuff so yeah there's a lot that going on to just design this one thing yeah that thank you <laughs> yeah definitely like comprehensive there's a lot of different aspects to it but yeah thank you for um all of your really great answers to all these questions um i know i really enjoyed your talk and it seems like everybody here did um so this will be available for um, people who weren't able to make it via recording um and yeah that's uh this workshop. Uh, Tana, feel free if you want to attend any of the other remaining workshops that we have for Catalyst. Um, we'd love to have you there as well. Um, but yeah, thank you everybody for coming. Um, good luck with all your projects. Go design. <laughs> Remember that projects are due tomorrow um, and just have a good time. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Good luck, everyone. Thanks for having me.